the additional offering on Feast of Trumpets. The additional offering on Feast of Trumpets. Our text is found in the book of Numbers, chapter 29, verse one through six. It states, and in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have an holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. And you shall offer a burnt offering for sweet savor unto Yah, one young bullock, one ram, and seven lambs of the first year without blemish. And their meat offering shall be a flour mingled with oil, three tenth deals for a bullock, and two tenth deals for a ram, and one tenth deal for one lamb throughout the seven lambs and one kid of the goats for a sin offering to make an atonement for you. Beside the burnt offering of the month and his meat offering and the daily burnt offering and his meat offering and their drink offerings according unto their manner for a sweet savor, a sacrifice made by fire unto Yah. Hallelujah. Haksamea, everybody. Haksamea. Happy feast. Haksamea. Haksamea. Hag means feast, and Samea means happy. Haksamea. As the fall feast start season starts today, it is always of primary interest that the focus of the feast season among Israelites is to understand it as a Israelite national celebration unto Yah. I keep emphasizing the concept of these observances from a nationalistic perspective because it's not a private or a personal uh, commemoration celebration. This is a time where Israelites should gather together as much as they can to celebrate this time as a group that is part of a nation. So tonight we're going to study the national importance of the Feast of Trumpets for the Israelite nation. As was just read in Numbers chapter 29, verse one through six, this description and instructions for the ceremonial offerings for the Feast of Trumpets are laws for a nationalistic offering by the people of Israel as a nation and not as individuals. And so the instructions of these offerings are, are instructions not for what individuals bring to the altar on the day of the Feast of trumpets, but it's what is brought on the day of feast of trumpets by the princes of the house of Israel, the house of Dawid, as we read last week in chapter 45, verse 17 of uh, the book of Ezekiel. They were the ones who were responsible of the rulers of the house of David to present the national sacrifices on behalf of the whole nation and present those uh, animals for the sacrifice to the priest to do the sacrifice. Uh, and so uh, each annual feast involves a national offering unto Yah on behalf of the entire nation. So as we do each of these feasts, we're starting tonight with Feast of Trumpets. The next week we do the commemoration fast day of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And then five days after that, we commence with uh, Sukkot, and which lasts seven days. And the last day, the eighth day, the great day uh, we observe that concludes this fall festival season. But we must keep in mind that all of these commemorations are to cause us to reflect 
on Yah's blessings to us as a nation, as well as how he blesses us individually. But particularly, these feasts are national observances. Just like in America, they, they commemorate a national holiday, like 4th of July. And it's really a national observance for the birth of this nation called America. But for Israelites, these feast days for us are national commemorations the way countries commemorate their independence day. Like here in Chicago last week, this time of year, you'll see a bunch of green, white uh, uh, flags flying and black flying all over the place for Mexican Independence Day celebrations. And uh, that, that was all over the city last week because we have such a large Mexican population. Well, for Israelites, this is our day of celebration. And these are our times of commemoration. And, and, and so we are instructed by Yah how to enjoy these festivals in the fall as a nation. And, and so we began with the, with the fact that each annual feast involves an offering unto Yah on behalf of the entire nation. However, individuals also presented their personal tithes and offerings at these times in ancient times unto Yah as well, as was instructed by the prophet Malachi. And you are familiar with this passage in Malachi chapter uh, 3, verses 8 through 10, where it says, Will a man rob Elohim? Yet you have robbed, but you say, Wherein have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now. Here will save Yah of If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So basically, the times of our national celebrations were the times when people presented their tithes and their offerings at those three times in the year. One in the time of the Passover unleavened bread, the second one in the time of uh of late spring with Shabuot, which is commonly known as Pentecost, and then the fall festival season, which we commence tonight. These were times where Israelites were giving as individuals and as a nation. And so uh, tonight though, we're gonna, going to uh, look at the national aspect of the fall festival season as commanded to do with the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, the Feast of the Israelite Feast Days all revolve around the stages of Israel's agricultural produce growth. The Fall Feast Days take place at the time of the harvest of the fall produce season because we, the Israelites, were an agrarian farming society. The state of our economy through the year would be established by the productivity of our spring harvest season and our fall harvest season. And it is during these seasonal harvest times that Yah instructed Israel to provide offerings unto him out of the produce of those seasonal harvests. And accompanying these uh, seasonal offerings, Yah instructs Israel to observe holy celebrations and feastings to commemorate his blessings on Israel. So uh, this is a time where people that want to celebrate with a little yam or some good food, some good music that commemorates, celebrates, and and gives honor unto Yah. This is that time. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Also, because the Israelite economy was primarily agricultural, economic budgeting and planning 
for the Israelite kingdom was determined by the profitability of the two harvest seasons in uh, spring and fall. Hence, the uh, fall harvest, which we commemorate tonight, it was the end of our agricultural year. Uh, Exodus chapter 23, verse 16 states, and the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou sown in the field, and the feast of being gathered, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. So the feast of first fruits called Shavuot or Pentecost is the time and celebration of the spring harvest season. But the fall harvest season, which the Feast of Trumpets is a part of, is called the Feast of Ingathering, which is in the end of the year. This phrase in uh, Exodus 23, 16, that this phrase, end of the year, that's used for the fall feast season is because this is the time of the end of the agricultural year and not the calendar year. Because in the Hebrew calendar year, there are 12 months, which ends at the beginning of spring. But the agricultural year ends in the time of the fall harvest. So the end of the agricultural year is the beginning of a new fiscal year, which is the time when there will be two new harvests, one coming in the next spring and one coming next year in the fall harvest season of next year. Hence, there are some Jewish people who call the Feast of Trumpets Rosh Hashanah because of the new fiscal year at the end of the agricultural year. Also, Ethiopian Jews, Beta Israel, who are our cousins, they celebrate the fiscal new year in the fall as well. And I've been with them for these celebrations in Ethiopia and in Israel. And they, they likewise call this time the new year. I, I do not quite subscribe to doing that, but I understand why they, they feel led to do it say it that way, but I, I don't subscribe to that. But the instructions for offerings of the Israelite national observance of the Feast of Trumpets is described in Numbers, what we just read, chapter 29, verse one through six. But because the Feast of Trumpets on the Hebrew calendar takes place on the first day of the seventh month, means that this feast takes place at the time also of the monthly new moon feast, which comes on the first day of each month. Hence, the feast day today, which is called the Feast of Trumpets, because this feast is a compound feast of a combination of the monthly new moon feast and the annual fall harvest feast season, which the Feast of Trumpets is a part of. And so this feast day is a compounded day of blowing of, of trumpets. You got trumpets that are to blow at the time of the new moon every month or the shofar. And you have the blowing of the shofar as well for the Feast of Trumpets. So this is a feast for double blowing of trumpets. So it, it's called Feast of Trumpets. I never seen it in Torah scripture where it's called Rosh Hashanah. All right. I've only seen it where it's called Feast of Trumpets. Now, this concept of two trumpet blasts, what is the significance of that two sets of trumpet blasts, one for the new moon, one for the uh, a set of blowings for the, the actual uh, fall festival season. Well, because it says in Numbers chapter 10, verse 10, Numbers chapter 10, verse 10, it says, also in the day of your gladness, you see, this should be a time of gladness. We should be saying, hot samea, means happy feast season, enjoying yourself in Yah, 
Okay. Also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days, that's your feast days, and in the beginnings of your month, that's your new moon, you shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices and your peace offerings that they may be to you for a memorial for your, before your Elohim. I am Yah, your Elohim. So as of now, we do not have sacrificial uh, altars and priests to perform, but we can offer the sacrifices of our lips, as Hosea said. And as said in the book of uh, Hebrews, to pay homage with the sacrifices of our praise, with our uh, giving thanks and honor and glory to him, and with the blowing of the shofars or the blowing of the horns and music. Uh, in Numbers 10.10, 10, it says that your solemn feast, of which the Feast of Trumpets is one of those, and the beginning of your month, which the new moon is, you shall blow with your trumpet. So here we got two feasts together. So the Feast of Trumpets has an additional offering with it. You have an offering both for the Feast of Trumpets, then you have an offering for the Feast of the New Moon. They all come together. And that's what our lesson was about tonight, explaining this about the additional offering for the Feast of Trumpets. And in Numbers, uh, it tells us that uh, we're to commemorate this with, with really signifying tremendous blessings by the blowing of the trumpet. So the combination of trumpet blowing for the Feast of Trumpets and trumpet blowing for the new moon is a special time of invoking the presence of Yahweh to remember to bless the nation of Israel. Let me repeat that. Again, uh, blowing of these trumpets is a special way or a special time for invoking the presence of Yahweh to really remember to bless the nation of Israel. Because these two feast days are a combination of two trumpet day observances in one day. The feast of trumpets in Hebrew is called Zachron Teruah in the Hebrew of Leviticus 23, verse 24, which means a memorial signal blowing. Uh, the signal blowing is the sound where it goes bop, 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 Not that sustained long blowing, but a bop, 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 bop. That's a signal blowing, not a blast. So that the signal blowing you can read more in detail about that in Numbers chapter 10. But uh, Zachron Teruah it, it, it is the, uh, it means a memorial signal blowing because the trumpet signal blowing is also a ceremonial way of calling to Yahweh to recognize and accept the offerings that are presented to him for the Feast of Trumpets and and the feast of the new moon in order that he will bless the nation of Israel. You see, it, it's, it, it's something we must understand about these offerings, like these feast seasons, because some people will read what it says in Isaiah chapter one, where Yah says, I'm fed up and I'm tired with your feast and your new moons. He talks about that he was fed up with that. And so some people say, well, then that means he don't really like you doing these feast days. I've heard people teach that, particularly in Christianity. But that's absolutely not what that means. It meant that some people are offering up sacrifice and doing the ceremony, but their, their spirit is not in that ceremony. And they're not living up to the righteousness that Yah would require to go with ceremonies. Because, you know, he told the prophet Samuel to tell Saul, Obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than praises and gift giving, and yet your heart's not there and your commitment to his commandments is not there. Well, he don't really care to get those kind of sacrifices. That's what he said wore him out in Isaiah 1. So people that take that to mean that he don't like sacrifices of praise and worship, uh, we, we don't do that anymore because he said he don't like it. Yeah, but you got to look at the context of what he's, why he said that. Uh, and, and so the blowing of the, uh, of the 
profile is an example to show to him that you're really sincere about observing this feast day. That, that you really mean it from your heart. You're not doing it grudgingly because, oh, it's just another one of these days. We got to get together and I can't look at football. I can't uh, do some other things I want to do with my family. Well, he don't like a giver like that. Scriptures tell us y'all loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. And blowing the shofar is uh, kind of like a pandemonium type of uh, experience of just really having a good time, commemorating and celebrating the blessings of Yah. And that's what our forefathers did in the fall harvest season. Uh, so in Numbers chapter 29, verse 1 through 6, Yah instructs the Hebrew Israelite nation how it can invoke his favor and bless it on the day of the Feast of Trumpets. First of all, he wants a lot of praise. <laughs> he, wants, he wants a lot of praise offerings at the end. So we played a little more songs tonight than we normally do in our get together. I don't know if y'all noticed that. We played a few more songs. I wish we could all sing together, you know, and sing the person, but on Zoom, uh, it, it has a delayed reaction. So we, we wouldn't be able to really sing in unison and harmony much, but so we, we have to play recorded music. But at least y'all knows our hearts, that, that we should really apply our hearts and minds, even with the recorded music. And I, I realize and understand it's nothing like when you get live music, but hey, it's what y'all's looking at the heart, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's in person, it can be for real or, or it can be phony. And so what we're reading in Numbers chapter 29, verse 1, is showing how Yah wants you to really understand how to, to really get into the offerings of this time in a way that pleases him. Because he has immediate blessings for you. And it's not just that you do this so you can get on his good side, just so he'll bless you. You do this because you love him. And you truly are grateful to him. So we pick up at, at verse 1, it says, of chapter 29, it says, and in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. So in verse one, he says, you shall have a holy meeting or convocation. It, this is implying having a holy meeting with other Israelites. So we're doing that right now on Zoom. Some people say, well, that don't count, you're not in person. Uh, well, we are in person by the spirit. We, we're not, we may not be in person by the flesh, but we're in person by the Ruach, by the Holy Spirit, we're in person. So this is a convocation. Don't ever let anybody make you doubt that what you're doing with this is less than what those who are able to do in person are doing. This is accepted in your sight as well as the other. Personally, I like both of them. But due to the fact that the Israelites, we as a people are scattered. And we are like sheep without shepherds. We don't have enough shepherds and elders, like Elder Yehuda and Elder Yaakov, and who I, am, I aspire and try to be. A, we don't have enough shepherds to manage all of our people all over this country. In fact, Yahshua even said in his time, he said, pray that more laborers will come into this harvest because we don't, we don't have enough. So what did Yah do? He made it where we can come together, spread out all over this country and around the world sometimes to convocate in these feast days on Zoom. And he's well ready to accept how we serve him. Secondly, we are not to do work on this day, if possible. I understand. In exile, we're not always in control of things, of our livelihood. And I will never criticize anybody who has to work and then tell them, oh, you're going to have to quit that job and be faithful and believe you get another job. Well, here's what I know, what Yeshua said about that. He told the hypocrites whose oxes fell in the ditch on the Shabbat 
day, and yet they went and worked to get that ox out of the ditch on the Shabbat day, yet they were falsely accusing people that had certain necessities to do on the Shabbat beyond their control. See, that's the kind of people whose offerings y'all don't want that stuff because they're phonies. They're not for real. And behind closed doors, they know they're not for real. But they got enough reason to judge people. And, and, and marginalized people. And, and so if somebody has to work, that's their livelihood. That's their ox in the ditch. Because in ancient Israelite economy, the ox was the, was the livelihood of, of that Israelite. They, that ox did work for them for harvesting and planting and things of that sort and type. So he, he had to go to work out of necessity, not because he wanted to. And so, like I said, in verse one, it says, not only are you to have a, a holy congregation, you are to do no servile work. That is, if possible. Now, some of us can go and ask our employer, say, I want this day off. You should prepare and plan for that if you can. Uh, and, and y'all will bless that, all right? But if it's beyond your control, well, just pray that y'all will make it where Eventually, you'll find favor where you can be off on these feast days. Uh, thirdly, he wants us to sound the trumpet. So if you got a shofar at home or you got a record or some music, or you got a horn or an instrument, just blow it a few times through this day. He loves it. Uh, and it's commanded. It, it, it is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. I remember when I had my two little children when I first came in to the truth. My older ones, they were grown and gone away to college, but my two younger ones, I went to Toys R Us and bought them little toy trumpets so they could blow on the day of the Feast of Trumpets. Cause I'd, you know, we were making our transition coming out of Christmas and Easter after all them years being deceived in that. So I wanted to get them equipped to understand that leaving the Easter Bunny and, and leaving Santa Claus, uh, that 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 Yah has his own good time celebration, which are his feast days. So they would get their, they would go to Toys R Us with me and get their little toys. I don't even think there's Toys R Us now. They get their little toys, uh, trumpets, and every every feast they just blow those shofar trumpets, uh, plastic little instruments and so if you have little children or you got grandchildren you want to get them involved for the feast days just get them some of those little toys where they can have a good time blowing it'll stick in their mind sometimes our young people understand things better with music and sounds than they do talking it, it communicates and registers more i think elder yahuda was showing me that today we were talking about hebrew with our young men that sometimes they like to hear the alphabet sung. And so uh, these are times, this is a family time. So fun with your home, with your relatives, with those of your loved ones. All right, now in verse two through five, Yah commands uh, that the National Feast of Trumpets would have offerings for Israel. All right, now let's look at these national offerings for Israel. Now this is, these are not offerings the individuals brought. These are offerings that the princes of the house of David, as we studied uh, Tuesday night, uh, where it was the uh, princes of the house of David supplied these to the priest on behalf of the nation. Uh, look at in verse two, what it says, uh, the animal offerings for, for this uh, day. Oh, hallelujah, I hear you. That's beautiful. All right. One young bullock, one ram, seven lambs, verse three and four. A specific measured flour offering mixed with oil to accompany the various animal offerings. Three tenths of flour to be baked with the bullock offering. Two tenths flour, four. The ram off. One tenth flour, flour for each of 
the lamb off. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shalom. All right. So, so uh, in verse five, it says, one goat kid for a sin, sin offering. Also, in verse six, it's, it describes that the regular new moon first of the month offering is to be offered as well. For it says in Numbers chapter 27, verse 11 through 15, regarding the first of the month new moon national sacrifice, but this is the additional sacrifice for the Feast of Trumpets. It's in verse 11, it says, and in the beginning of your month, you shall offer a burnt offering unto Yah, two young bullocks and one lamb, ram, seven lambs of the first year without a spot, and three-tenth deals of flour for a meat offering, mingled with oil for one bullock, two-tenths of flour for a meat offering, mingled with oil for one ram. Now, y'all know what they're making when they're getting flour mixed with, with oil and putting it in a frying pan. They're they making some hot water bread there that, that, that some people make that with corn and call it hot water cornbread. They're they making uh, some, some, some cooked fried cooked bread like that. Where do you think we get that from? Why we like eating like that so much? And then uh, in three tenth deals of flour for a meat offering, uh, mingled with oil for one bullock, two tenths of flour for a meat offering, Mingle with oil for one ram. Mm. I can smell how good that smells now. Uh, and a several tenth deal of flour mingled with oil for a meat offering unto one lamb for a burnt offering of a sweet savor. A sacrifice made by fire unto Yah. And oh yes, verse 14. And a drink offerings shall be half in hind of wine unto a bullock. And a third part of a hind unto a ram, and a fourth part of a hind unto a, a lamb. This is the burnt offering every month throughout the month of the year. Now, you can't have a Hebrew feast without, without some, some drink offerings, uh, some, some, some offerings with the wine and the strong drink. You, Israelites in that time we weren't calling out to be alcoholics, but this, this was a time that they would commemorate and celebrate with wine and, and celebration, good food. And then this offering is a libation unto Yah, poured out unto Yah. Say, here's one for Yah, you know, and pour it there at the, at the altar. They say, you know, this one's on us, Yah. <laughs> you know how people used to say, first round's on me. Uh, but this one is, you're telling y'all, oh, this round is on me, y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just talking Hebrew now, y'all. I'm not talking gutter. You know? I'm not talking street. I'm talking Israelite. I'm talking Torah. And it says, and one kid of the goats for sin offering unto y'all shall be offered beside the continual burnt offering and his drink offering. So the additional new moon offerings Numbers 28, 11, 15, in conjunction with the Feast of Trumpets offering in Numbers 29, verse 1 through 6, represent a double emphasis of memorializing or, or reminding the nation of Israel of the goodness of Yah's blessings to the Israelite nation. This is like the way Yahshua taught us for instance, or how to memorialize or remember his death by the ceremony of the Master's Supper, which commemorates his sufferings for his people. So too, each of the sacrificial animals that, that, that are instructed to be offered uh, and the uh, mincha or meal offerings or mincha offerings and the strong drink libation that are offered in the Feast of Trumpets and the new moon celebration were to illustrate the goodness of Yah's blessings to Israel through his son, Yahshua HaMashiach. Right now, 
this week, this past week, in the state of Israel, the people calling themselves the Temple Institute, who want to build a temple to reactivate these animal sacrifices, they brought in some red heifer bulls, or cows, red heifer cows from America that fit the description in in uh, chapter 19 of Numbers, they got them because they, they want to build the temple and you can't build a temple without having the purification of the temple by the ashes of sacrificial red heifers. Okay, so they want to go through all the ceremonies. They read these passages and I've actually met some of these people in Jerusalem. They weren't too happy or friendly with me and I saw what they were trying to do and observed them and Yet, in all that they've done, I mean, you can go on YouTube how they were all rejoicing that they got these red heifers, these female cows, the red heifers. That meant it's a, only a cow that's totally reddish color that was to be offered for the, the, the purification water of, of a rebuilt temple. And they found enough of them where they feel they can rebuild a temple. And, and and I, I saw these evangelical Christian people like CBN, Pat Robertson, and, and uh, Hagee and all, and they, they're all on YouTube uh, uh, just commemorating and, and uh, celebrating the significance of prophecy around those red heifers. And yet, I could talk, if I could talk to these people who claim to be followers of Yahshua, why are you glorifying in what these people are doing, setting up sacrifices when none of those sacrifices they're doing, have, they do not recognize the meaning of those sacrifices as referring to Yahshua because they don't believe in Yahshua and they hate Yahshua. So, so why are people getting caught up with the significance of what's going on right now in the land of Israel? With the, the Rev, they may try to do something tonight. I don't know. I noticed lately that more of them are walking up on top of what they call the Temple Mount, where the Dome of the Rock is, which is really angering the Muslims, the Palestinians up there. But the reality of the matter is um, that's not even the real place where the temple was. Not only that, they're just doing ceremonies that don't involve Yah's son. Those are the kind of sacrifices Yah said, I'm tired of that. I don't want that. Because these ceremonies, if you really want to commemorate and celebrate the goodness of Yah through the Feast of Trumpets, you've got to celebrate and commemorate the goodness of Yah through his son, Yeshua, Hamashiach. And to accentuate and emphasize this truth of the goodness of Yah to Israel through his son, Yeshua, Hamashiach, trumpets were to be blown over the Feast of Trumpets and New Moons offerings as a signal or a teruah in Hebrew. Their signal or teruah reminders to Israelites to continue to acknowledge and remember to praise and worship Yah for his ultimate goodness to Israel, which is through Yeshua HaMashiach. So all of those aspects of the sacrifices, all and somehow, that we were instructed in numbers, they all in some way or another reflect something of the goodness of Yahshua towards us. For example, his goodness to us is his forgiveness of our sin through Yahshua, as illustrated by the great sacrifice at the Feast of Trumpets, as described in Numbers 29 5. Verse 5 says, And one kid of the goats for a sin offering to make an atonement for you. That means every Feast of Trumpets, you're supposed to have an atonement offering of a goat. Hallelujah. What, what does this mean? It's because the goat represents, the meaning of it is referring to Yeshua. All right, as an atonement. Also, the burnt offering sacrifice of a bullock in Numbers 29 2 is to illustrate the goodness of the servanthood of Yahshua's ministry, like that of the service of a domesticated ox for agricultural produce. So to Yahshua's service, 
to Israel was seen by his ministry of healing the sick, feeding the poor, giving sight to the blind, opening deaf ears, straightening out women that were bound and saying, woman, thou art loose, casting out demons, raising the dead, teaching the truth, et cetera, et cetera. We could go on and on. So too, we should praise him for his service and intervening blessings in our daily livelihood challenges that we face on the jobs and in our day-to-day -day living. That he, he comes through for us. And, and so uh, the ox or the, the, the bullock sacrifice represents him serving us by serving our needs and providing for our needs. Also the ram sacrifice, which was described in Numbers 29 too, it represents his leadership in our lives because the ram in the scriptures represents leadership. So this is an offering to remember, to praise Yah for his guidance and leadership to us through the complexities of life, because life is very complicated. But somehow through all the complexities of how we're going to make it and how we're going to get through from the challenges day to day, nonetheless, that offering of the ram illustrates leadership that is sacrificed on your behalf as it means to put you under the control and the intervention of the power of Yah through the sacrifice of Yeshua. The seven lambs without blemish that were offered, seven of course being the divine number of fulfillment, were to illustrate the fulfillment in Yeshua of our eternal salvation as a nation and as individuals. To forever have forgiveness through the blood of the lamb, Yeshua HaMashiach, our savior, hallelujah. Also the mincha offerings, which were called the meal or the meat offerings. These, these are the grain offerings. Uh, also these mincha offerings in the additional monthly new moon offerings uh, in uh, Numbers chapter 28, which is the baked flour and oil bread would accompany each of the animal offerings to represent the body of the Messiah Yeshua that was broken for us, as he said in Matthew 26, six. And as they were eating, Yahshua took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the dis disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Also in Numbers chapter 29 verse 14, regarding the strong drink offerings of the new moon celebration in conjunction with the Feast of Trumpets, there is a witness of the blood of the Messiah as Yah's confirmation of the coming new covenant with Israel as commemorated in the Last Supper when Yahshua said in Matthew chapter 26, verse 27 through 28, and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink you all of it. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the removal of sin or the remission of sin. Hallelujah. You see, Israel as a nation, we have to have a covenant renewal through Yahshua for the removing of sin from us as a nation. If a lot of people want to understand what Israel should do, the number one priority is Israel's got to be right with Yah before he can do anything right. Let me repeat myself. Before Israel can do anything that's right, it's got to be right with Yah. And you see, Israel as a nation has to learn how to collectively submit themselves unto Yahshua. Now, Here's what's getting ready to happen. We know that not all Israelites believe in Yeshua. And they will read what I'm saying from Leviticus or Numbers 
about the sacrifices on the Feast of Trumpets. And there are many of them who deny Yahshua, period. Then there are those who do not believe everything about him. They believe some things about him, but not everything about him. All right. Now, we must understand that on the Feast of Trumpets, this is another opportunity when we come together to praise and worship that we can get on Yah's good side to be right with Yah as a nation of people. He's looking for people as yourselves who he can build a new collective Israel that is right through the blood of Yahshua Hamashiach. Because you can see the Jewish state of Israel is not right through the blood of Yeshua. Beside that, most of them are not ethnic Israelites anyway. Then there are those Israelites that are not right with Yah through the blood of Yeshua because they don't acknowledge it. And so where we are as a nation, and we are a nation, you right here on this Zoom, this small group, you are part of a nation. If you're observing the Feast of Trumpets tonight, you're acknowledging, whether you realize it or not, that you are part of a nation. This is, this is a national celebration. How can somebody celebrate the 4th of July and say they're not an American? Well, how can you say you're an Israelite and you don't celebrate the Feast of Trumpets as, uh, uh, as an Israelite? You're celebrating as an Israelite. You're celebrating as a citizen and a member of a nation. Now, these sacrifices were stopped in ancient times because Israel lost the meaning of what they were about, the intention of what they were about, and Israel lost their sincerity of the practice of these sacrifices. You can read a lot about what the prophets say about that, that, that their hearts weren't in what they were doing. They were just doing this as a ritual, and yet they were doing everything and everything wrong according to Yah's laws and commandments. And they, by the time of Yeshua, the people that were doing the sacrifice, the priests were all cutthroat robbers that made the house of Yah den of robbers. Yah's not going to accept nothing from that. So he did away with that system then in 70 AD. However, Daniel does tell us in, in the section of Daniel chapter 9 that these ceremonies will be reactivated. I can only tell you what he's saying. I'm not telling you what I believe or what I think or my opinion because I know to some of us these concepts of a literal sacrifice is somewhat uh, strange to us and are difficult to accept, particularly because we recognize the significance of the sacrifice of Yahshua. So we would say, why would we need to go back to these animal sacrifices? Now, first of all, I know some of us say, well, it's cruelty to animals, but I know some of us on these Labor Days and 4th of July, we kill up and slaughter up a lot of animals and put them on grills and barbecue a lot of animal meat. And so I always wonder, I said, well, look at what you're doing with that. This, all these instructions are that, all right. So I understand that concerning these matters, the main objection is, is somehow it takes away from the relevance of what Yahshua did by dying on the tree for us. And I can respect that. And I can respect people who object to what I'm saying because of their love for Yahshua's sacrifice. But if I could, if you could just allow me just to say this uh, in, in sincerity to your sincerity and your love of the master. What if I told you that Yahshua himself will initiate these sacrifices to be reactivated again. That it's him that, that wants to reactivate. And if I could show you in the scriptures where, where I'm getting that, if you could listen to it and listen to him and, and not listen to me, I'm glad I got a scripture before you right now that, that these feast sacrifices 
will be reactivated by Yeshua. Now, some of us have a King James Version Bible uh, that, that you're going to read from Daniel chapter 9. But I'm going to read from an older text translation to the King James Version. I'm going to read from the Septuagint Version. And I'm going to read chapter 9 of the book of Daniel, verses 26 through 27. I won't be able to explain everything in these verses. These verses are packed. But I'm just going to highlight the point I'm making that Yahshua is himself going to reactivate the animal sacrifice. Listen to this, verse 26 through 27. And after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be destroyed. And there is no justice in him. That means he's unfairly killed. There was no justice to how they killed the Messiah. It was totally unjust. So there was no judgment in him, meant that there was no justice for him. And so it says in this text, now this, this, I want you to hear me clearly. You can Google this, Septuagint, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. It says, after 62 weeks, the anointed one, the Messiah, shall be destroyed. And there is no justice in it. There's no justice done or judgment in it. Then it says, and he shall destroy the city and the sanctuary with the prince that is coming So. 39 years later, after Yahshua was killed in Jerusalem, he allowed the prince of Rome, General Titus, the son of the emperor of Rome, Vespasian's son, he allowed General Titus, who was a prince, to come in and devastate and destroy Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. And they killed up all of the priests. And that ended the sacrificial system as it is to this day. And here in this text, it says that Yahshua initiated this judgment. The Messiah initiated this judgment on Jerusalem. And that's something to look into. And he says of Jerusalem, our ancestors, he had warned us, he said, we, we would be scattered and taken hostage among all nations. In Matthew 21, verse 24, he said, they shall be cut off with the flood and to the end of the war. That is, some people didn't know that that war in 70 AD, it, it, it lasted beyond 70 AD all the way to 135 AD. It was called the Quito's War. And Israelites, wherever we were scattered in the Roman world after that, we kept fighting the Romans. We would slaughter any Roman we saw for what they did to Jerusalem. We were terrorists. We had become terrorists to the Roman Empire. And the Romans were too busy fighting the Iranians at the time, so they let us just kill up Romans in Egypt and in uh, North Africa. But finally, the Romans turned their attention back on us again. And we have built up another rebellion in the land of Israel with a false messiah promoted by a false Jew named uh, Akiva, a rabbi Jew who was, the, it was a Roman convert. Akiva was a Roman convert. He wasn't even a Hebrew, yet he's considered the leading rabbi of Judaism. And he was a Roman. He wasn't even a Hebrew. Yet he's looked upon by modern rabbis as the leading rabbi of Israel. And they led a revolt in 135 against uh, the Roman Emperor Hadrian. And Hadrian just came and wasted us, both in North Africa and even put a decree not even to call our land the land of Israel. They called our, he, he gave the name of the land of our forefathers. He changed it from being called the land of Israel, and he gave it the name of people who were our enemies, the Philistines, which in Hebrew is pronounced Philistines, 
are uh, Palestinians. And so the land, he gave the name of our land, the land of Palestine. You see, that some people want to still keep calling it the land of Palestine. Well, that's something that the Romans did to wipe us out. And they forbid that we could come back in the land for many, many years. For many years, we were not allowed to even, if you were in Israel, if you were found there by the Romans, they would kill you. You see, so Yahshua initiated that. Uh, I know we can only say, you know, he wasn't dealt with justly. But he sure dealt with us justly because we deserved every bit of that butt whooping. The way we behaved and acted, letting a rabbi that's a Roman. These are the people that Yeshua said are the synagogue of Satan in the book of Revelation, who say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. And we were subscribing to these people. And some of us trying to get citizenship in the land of Israel now are subscribing to conversion to Judaism. Well, we have to sit up and learn under some of these non-Hebrew rabbis who will sign a paper saying, he's okay, she's okay. They can become a citizen. They can live among us. Well, I'm not gonna submit to that. And I pray you don't, because that would be denying the Messiah. And, and then Daniel 20, chapter nine, verse 26 says, and the end of the war, which is rapidly completed, he shall appoint the city to desolation. Basically, much of what our land used to be like has not yet been recovered. Sure, the Jewish people have built up some modern cities there, but those modern cities are like oases in the midst of a very desolate land, a desert land that's arid and dry. And most of it is just totally, just totally unlivable to live in. But this text says that Yahshua caused that to happen. He warned Israel. He said, I would have gathered you. He said, I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chick under his wings, but you wouldn't have it. Therefore, your house is left to you desolate. And you will not see me again till you say, Baruch, Abba, Hashem, Yahweh. Blessed is he to come in the name of Yahweh. All right, so he stopped that whole sacrificial system. However, in verse 27 of Daniel 9, he says, in one week shall establish the covenant with many. Now, this is talking about Yahshua reestablishing a covenant with the children of Israel. And see, these sacrifices that we were reading about for the Feast of Trumpet were to commemorate some aspect about covenant renewal or covenant relationship between Yah and Israel to bless us as a nation in our own land as a nation. Uh, and, and then we read in Daniel 9, 27, he says for one week or seven years, he will establish the covenant with many. That is, we're, we're coming to a seven year period. You'll know when that seven year period starts well, all of a sudden you'll notice that he has reestablished covenant with you. Now, how will Israel know that Yah has reestablished covenant? Well, I can tell you by investigating this verse in the Septuagint. During that seven year period, which is called a week, he says, in the midst of the week, my sacrifice and drink offerings shall be taken away. Well, in the midst of this coming future week where Yah reestablishes covenant, with us through Yahshua. Yahshua will reinstitute the sacrificial system because in the middle of that 70 year period, the Antichrist, the desolate, will come and stop the sacrifices in the middle of that seven year period. 
And according to this, Yahshua is saying that he will, he, he, and in the midst of the week, my sacrifice and drink offerings shall be taken away. Now, now notice that he's taking ownership of these sacrifices and offerings in the latter days, leading up to the end of the age. He's taking ownership of it. So if you, you feel you can't accept what I'm saying, and I can appreciate it if you don't, because I know you love them. And, and you, you, most Israelites I know that love them just, just, just can't accept that, that you, you would have animal sacrifices because that might somehow deflect from him. And I can, I can definitely sympathize with that. And I'm not making fun or criticize anybody that holds that. But I just want to say this. Just read this verse and just look at what he's saying, that these are my sacrifices not yours or somebody else. So they can't be called my sacrifices if he hadn't initiated those aspects to be resumed. And so that's why I'm saying today, as we read these feast uh, instructions, they are for us as a nation and each year that we've not been a nation since the destruction of Jerusalem, our whole aspiration has been to remember these times when we were a nation practicing these ceremonies on our feast days because it's, it's difficult with the way we commemorate these ceremonies in the feast days of this exile. And so as we consider the current condition of our nation of Israel, this Feast of Trumpets, we can have joy in reviewing the reason for the season of this national Israelite holy day. Because there's a prophecy for, of hope for us as a nation at this time of the Feast of Trumpets. For instance, in Isaiah 18, three, it says, all you inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth see you when he lift up an ensign on the mountains and when he blow up a trumpet, hear you. And then it says in chapter 18, verse seven, in that time shall the present be brought unto Yahweh of hope of a people scattered and peeled and from a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden underfoot whose land the rivers have spoiled to the place of the name of Yah of hosts, the Mount Zion. So he said, you got to bring a tribute blessing. You got to bring an offering to me in Mount Zion. The only way you're going to have an offering for him in my saying, you got to have that system reactivated. That was, was involved with, with these festive seasonal celebrations that we, we are looking at tonight as one of them with the Feast of Trumpets. All right? Uh, so this is a prophecy that we just read in Isaiah 18 of our future regathering to the land in the time of the Feast of Trumpets. Because in verse three, it says, blow a trumpet of Isaiah chapter 18, which is a signal reminder of the goodness of Yah. So did this, and, and blow it on the mountain. In, in, in uh, you are to respond by bringing an offering, where there's a trumpet blow, just like what we read in uh, uh, the book of Numbers chapter 29, verse one through six. Also Isaiah 27, verse 13, says, and it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcast in the land of Egypt and shall worship Yah in the holy mount at Jerusalem. And so also in the time of the second coming of our savior Yahshua, he said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 32, 30 through 31. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect 
from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Hallelujah. Hoxamaya. 